Welcome along to Friday Forum Live, coming to you from Point Blank, where today I am joined in the studio by Lee Rouse, one half of Plump DJs. <laughs> As one half of the infamous DJ duo, Lee was at the forefront of the breakbeat scene, playing at some of the world's most respected clubs and festivals along the way, including a 10-year residency at Fabric here in London. Uh, the duo have also remixed for the likes of Dead Mouse, Dave Spoon and uh, the Stanton Warriors as well. Um, their sets are renowned for, for their high octane energy um, and a four deck setup as well, um, pretty much wowing audiences everywhere they play. Um, so over the years they, they've maintained a pretty sterling reputation for, for their sets as well as their studio productions, uh, many of which have been released on, on Finger Licking and Grand Hotel Records. Um, and have also um, created huge club smashes, the likes of Light Fantastic, which was um, nominated as Mix Mag's uh, Tune of the Year in 2011. Um, so yeah, we're going to chat to Lee about uh, his kind of history in the scene, um, also the, the kind of start of the Plump DJs. Um, and it's also your chance at home to ask any questions, so make sure you get involved and post up in the chat room. Um, so yeah, welcome along Lee, welcome to Point Blank. Nice to be here. Um, cool man, so um, the very first thing I thought we should, we should ask really is about how um, you got started, um, you know, your, your kind of background and how um, you and Andy met and, and started the Plumps. Um, yeah, I got started uh, initially in, involved in making music, I suppose, when I was very young. My dad bought me an acoustic guitar right. um, at my junior school, um, but I didn't actually study music as I was growing up. I was sort of um, quite creative and basically persuaded um, to move into something that might be more a little bit more substantial, so I got into design and architecture and, and went okay. and studied to become an architect, but unfortunately didn't. Um, sort of uh, make the grade really and there was right. a big recession in the early 90s mm -hmm. um, so there was there was no work for for us in that field so I started putting on parties in London. Um, when you were doing the architecture stuff were you still like kind of DJing and making music? No, no not at all okay. I just started um, I learned to DJ sort of in the early night very early 90s mm -hmm. um, and then really just I st started getting sort of temporary work and just trying to find a way into the music business and I was really interested in putting on parties in London, so we were putting on braid dance parties, and mm -hmm. um, that's when I met Matt um, Cantor uh, from the Freestylers and Andy, who's my now musical um, partner, and mm. um, programmed them to DJ at the parties, and um, things sort of blossomed from there, really. Uh, my DJ career kicked off, and Andy and Matt had a production career at the time that was blooming, um, mm -hmm. and um, Andy and I decided to sort of join forces and share his side was the production element and my side was the um, the DJing element mm -hmm. and um, yeah we formed the Plump DJs then in sort of the late 90s and we've not looked back really so yeah yeah, yeah most definitely I mean um, just before we we go any further we've actually got um, a quick uh, clip of, of Light Fantastic um, the video that um, actually features the Ghost Rider clip as well I think oh right okay yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah let's get a listen to that um, and we'll come back So that was uh, Light Fantastic. Um, can you tell us, you know, obviously, uh, from what you said now, you're, you're kind of DJing a lot, starting on the production side of things. How do you go from there to, to a track like Light Fantastic that, that kind of really, really blew up, really? Um, what, from the inception? The, the yeah, idea I mean, from, you... from, you know, from putting on the parties, DJing a little bit, to, oh, right. to things really kind of taking off for you guys. Well, the parties, um, we, we were playing a specific type of music back then that we were referring to as breaks or... Um, breakbeat and we were one of the first people to be doing parties of that type mm -hmm. and the music that the DJs were playing was basically music 
brought from a number of different genres um, that had breaks in them, and, and also you know DJ's own productions, producers' own productions of that era, and um, you know because of that scene blossoming, we, we got all that energy and focus, and that really helped us to, to be brought, you know, to be given a big platform, as it mm -hmm. were, for our own music. Um, and we then uh, got signed to Finger Licking Records, which really helped us massively. Um, they sort of um, set us on a path, really, to, to you know, a long period of a successful production, mm. um, which combined with the Fabric res Residency at the time, as the resident DJs there, um, you know, pushing that sound, mm. um, yeah, we had, you know, a good run of, uh, of, of serious success and mm. uh, remixes and world tours, um, you know, our music was being um, licensed to big adverts and, and, and films and, mm -hmm. um, you know, enjoying all of the uh, fruits of our labours at yeah. the time. Mm. And obviously it was quite a kind of a London-centric scene at the time, I guess, it's quite a London sound. We, we thought so, but then... Right. Um, uh, soon after doing our own night, we realised there were other people in, in London. There was a guy called, um, uh, at the time, uh, Paul Arnold, uh, down yeah, in Brixton yeah. doing Chew the Fat, and yeah. Rennie Pilgrim, uh, Adam Freed and, and Teo doing um, uh, their, their Thursday club at um, Shaftesbury Avenue. And, mm -hmm. and then we realised up and down the country there were other people mm -hmm. getting into the same sound. And um, then around the world there were too, mm -hmm. you know, um, all over the world from here to Australia, you know, people... Uh, at the same time, getting into the same style of music and just really, really enjoying it. So mm. um, suddenly we were, yeah, pushed from um, our smaller uh, student-style lifestyles to uh, <laughs> international uh, acclaim. Yeah, yeah quite, quite a jump as yeah. well. I take it. Uh, so I was also going to say, General Middy, um, who is uh, is actually a teacher here. He teaches uh, sound engineering and music production. Excellent. Uh, did you work together at all? I'm not sure if you guys did. We, he, well, actually, he. We got, um, he kindly gave us the use of one of his tracks on one of our first compilations, which was the uh, Elastic Breaks compilation for yeah, Mixmag. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that really sort of set us on a, on a, a big leap up. Um, but yeah, I've not, uh, I've not worked with him. It'd be a good yeah. idea though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll give him a shout later on. Yeah, anyway. it should do, it'd be fun. Um, so obviously we've kind of um, gone through the, the early days really. Um, how was, you know, obviously you've, you've kind of been, been making music for a long, long time, have mm. been involved in it a long time. How have things, um, you know, changed? I take it in, in those days, you know, a studio set up, it's going to have been quite different from, from the way you're, you guys work now. Mm. Yeah, um, in the early days, the, the plump studio or the Boratoir plump, as we sort of refer to it. <laughs> Boratoir plump. It's, uh, it used to be basically just loads of wires, and, you know, some random, a random collection of guitar pedals, mm -hmm. you know, a simple Mackie desk. Uh, uh, Akai sampler and some NS10s and um, a couple of, of old, old school synths um, and that was it and we, mm. we our monitoring was limited the equipment we had was limited but um, I think we were very passionate to try and innovate and with the limited tools um, we really managed to push the boundaries uh, and got some great results I think um, f through uh, you know financially we've been able to add to the studio now, uh, Andy's created, which is, is something a little bit more like the captain's log on right. Starship Enterprise now, <laughs> rather than the studio of, of old. Yeah, um, yeah. So we've got a lot more, lot, many more synthesizers, you know, a, a much bigger desk, fantastic mm. monitoring. Um, and that's great, you know. Um, it comes with its own problems, obviously the menu's so big now. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. It's hard to make decisions sometimes, you know. Which I think that's something that comes up a lot actually yeah. when we talk to producers. Is um, you know people do tend to hark back to the days when you have a slight restriction just means you learn stuff inside out and you, you know you kind of get a bit more creative with it than having endless menus and options basically. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And we've you know we've expanded. Um, we've got some some really nice electric uh, guitars and. Um, it's almost like a sort of analog um, museum, really. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's a wonderful place to be. But as I mm. said, we do have to sort of limit our, limit ourselves. Now, sometimes we'll just say that synth, that production technique, mm. uh, maybe the, that plug-in, or um, and just really stick stick to our guns. And then you get some uh, succinct nuances in the record you're producing, mm. uh, which is which is great. It gives, yeah. it gives the every record an individual sort of style. The other thing um, I wanted to ask you about is, is obviously you're, you're very much known for, for the DJ set, especially the four deck um, setup. Can you talk us a bit about through the setup itself and, and how mm. the sets run? It's, yeah, it's really simple. Um, we were playing just back to back for years, um, and um, a friend of ours saw us playing at the Sydney Festival in front of about 
eight or nine thousand people and right. said he was really upset with the stage presence. He said, he was, <laughs> said we could do much, much better. And we, basically, at the time, it was one of us ha having a cigarette and a, and a pint. Right. And, the other yeah, one was yeah, yeah. Yeah. and we sort of thought maybe we should do a bit more. Um, given the responsibility. And, and, <laughs> and the 9,000 well, people watching. Yeah, well, we still got great reactions, but <laughs> I think he was right to point that out. But we, so we, we started experimenting with the four deck thing and Andy and I have been DJing together for so long, we've got mm. a sort of ESP. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, we've just got four, four CDJs in line. Um, we've got a, a box called a Q2, which allows us both to hear what each other's okay, doing, right. which, which is a funny uh, piece of equipment in that only in that there's no mix you can buy with two headphone outs out, yeah. which is very strange yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so given the amount of DJ duos I guess that are around as well exactly but yeah. not a lot, there aren't many DJ duos out there that do play live that do yeah. play yeah. to the audience a lot of people have pre-programmed sets mm -hmm. um, so ours are always you know they're, they're, they're always change uh, every every set will be completely different and mm. we can really read each other and read the crowd and, and be versatile like that because of our setup um, and then not having to use two mixers as well. You don't have mm -hmm. those inline problems with setup, uh, sound differences and yeah. stuff. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really coming to its own. We feel really comfortable up there and, mm. we, and, and the setup works in small clubs and, and at big festivals too, so it's great. Do you use uh, Serato or digital no. software? No, CDJ. Should really now, but um, we still like the hands-on. Yeah, thing. I'm the same, I think. Yeah. You know, I like to flick through stuff. You know. not, we've not quite sort of made that <laughs> jump. I don't think we really want to. <laughs> it just doesn't compute to us. Yeah. I suppose we we do like to have a few beers while we're DJing. We do yeah, like yeah. to feel loose and and doesn't quite get our heads like you're looking at a computer <laughs> screen and small. Yeah, you know, I know what you mean. Fiddling around with a laptop, basically. It doesn't, it doesn't feel. It doesn't. It's not like a fiddling around environment. And like, uh, <laughs> it's more of a jumping around yeah. environment. So. Um, just before we go any further, let's get a quick tracker. We've got another one. Uh, Gobstopper. Great, right, um, yeah. yeah, so let, let's have a listen to that one as well. So uh, that, that was Gobstopper. Yeah. Um, when was that one out, Gobstopper? Just over a year ago now. Yeah, um, yeah great tune for us, big tune for us. Mm. And how has the, um, you know, your, your kind of, for you, the tracks developed over time? You know, I think there's definitely been a change, you know, mm. in the sound from, from those, uh, from the kind of breakbeat, early breakbeat stuff. Um, how, how did stuff develop for you in terms of your, your sound as a plumber? Um, we've always like, we've always been fond of inno innovation and, um, I think really coming up with a fresh idea in the studio and, and something that no one's heard yet mm. um, or an idea that no one's experienced yet. And that, that really keeps us going and that really is the, th the thing that got us experimenting with breakbeat in the first mm. place really because um, they were the idea of the breaks record or the breaks breakbeat as a genre it hadn't really been sort of... Um, not plundered's not the right word, but got into it as such. <laughs> well, yeah, um, I'm interested. What was the kind of, um, you know, the, the scene in London like before, you know, what, what kind of led you to that sound? Was What was going on at the time? Well, we were really into our house music and right. um, we, were, we were raving and um, partying on the weekends and, and all week and every day. And, <laughs> but the unfortunately, a lot of the music that was coming out in, in the sort of mid-90s uh, mm. mid became very sort of glam and, and cheesy, really, mm. and lost a lot of, a lot, lot of its early attitude. Uh, and we found that we wanted that that kind of attitude. You mm. know, it was almost like a revolt to the overtly glam situation yeah. that was yeah, going yeah. on. Um, so you know, that's that's what pushed us into that that environment. Um, but along the way, you know, we've we've developed massively. You know, for, as you mm. say, you're correct. Um, but I mean, we've got very broad taste in music, and, and we just like coming up with new ideas. And we've sort of. We've got yeah a lot a lot more uh, 
bridges to cross as well. I yeah. yeah, yeah. And what's um, what have you got kind of um, coming up? And, and um, I know you're doing a lot of stuff at XOWire and the Nest as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, great platform for us in London at the moment. Um, XOWire is a fantastic club um, mm. down in Old Street, and uh, the Nest, yeah, two great um, cornerstones of London clubbing now. Yeah, um, and we've, we're playing at the Nest on the 28th of June, I think, and the um, XOY in, in August, I think the 28th of August. So playing there, we're look, really looking forward to those gigs. And we've had a long string of uh, successful events there now over the last two years. So um, it's great to have that that sort of seat for us in London. Mm. You know, it's um, essential because we're, oh, we're London-based. Yeah. So. And do you, um, do you curate your own nights? You know, obviously, going back to the old days of, of putting on parties, do you get a chance to do that? Um, well, we, we help program the events when asked. Mm -hmm. um, we put ideas forward. We try as much as we can to be involved with the venues and, and, and the promoters, and you try and really build up a rapport and good communication and get feedback as well. Mm -hmm. That's really important. I think um, you can get great feedback now from, from the internet and from social media. Yeah, most definitely. Um, yeah. Which really helps too, so that, that helps us with the events. But it's nice, it's nice just performing and, and making the music. You mm -hmm. know, it's less stressful. <laughs> than getting involved than, in yeah, the whole party. Than, yeah, I guess so. Uh, being a promoter is the kind of semi-thankless task, I guess. Yeah, it's a really, really tough job yeah. being a promoter. You can be an excellent promoter and just have, be unlucky and lose a fortune. Mm. Uh, so it's, you've got to have uh, big balls to, to be a promoter, <laughs> I think. Yeah. And uh, you're doing a festival soon as well? Noisily Festival this weekend. Uh, no, so, sorry, next weekend. Um, then with Shambhala in uh, Canada and... Uh, where else are we playing? We've got a festival in uh, America, one in Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's going to be a good summer, I think. And um, we've, I think we've also got um, a bit of an exclusive preview, um, one of your new tunes. Um, can you give us a bit of an intro to it and we'll take a listen? Oh, uh, well, the Super Imploder, I think you've yes, got. Yes, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's quite noisy, so <laughs> you don't like noisy records. Don't, it's you know, Friday don't afternoon, listen. Yeah, it's it? Friday yeah. afternoon, have a beer and yeah. listen to some noise. Yeah, once again, you know, we just wanted to, we, we're sort of embracing the idea of chaos in music a bit more at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, we, again, is that a kind of sort of, um, you know, response to things being quite deep and, you know, at the a, moment? In a way, I mean, I'm not sure. It was not really in a response to the general environment. It's right. just a, a sort of thing that's turning us on at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, yeah, it's, um, it's a big record. Um, we're getting some great response already, um, so yeah, just have a listen. I don't like to describe tunes too much. <laughs> it's quite hard to describe sounds. Yeah, yeah. But it's noisy. It's it's bassy, um, and every time we played it out, the place goes nuts. So that's, excellent description. Yeah, that's I enough, think. Yeah. yeah, let's take a listen. So that was uh, Super Imploder. Um, just before we, we um, wrap up, we've also got a question from one of the guys in the chat room. Um, just to get a rep has asked, um, he says, well, he says, uh, I know you for breakbeat, uh, but where does, does that stem from? Is it a love of, of hip hop um, or based from, from old school dance or, you know, where does that kind of inspiration come yeah, from? Yeah, well, we both grew up in the, in the sort of, you know, uh, the, the sort of uh, influ influential years of the late 80s. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and we got we got old school. What is old school hip hop? Yeah, you know, a big time. Um, I used to, you know, attempt break dancing at the local town centre, <laughs> carry sound systems on our shoulders, bag and, a lino uh, under the arm. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, that we we love that kind of music. And I think of the early parties I was putting on in London, I used to invite uh, b boy crews down to break dance and. Um, you know, and we had scratch DJs down, and there was a real hip hop feel to the whole mm -hmm. thing. 
and that's really what fused part of um, the sound of the Freskin Over Records, which was a big influence on us um, okay, right, in yeah, those yeah. days. Um, and that's really, you know, I love break breaks came from that mm -hmm. era and and of course old funk records that yeah the original yeah, funk yeah, records yeah. that the breaks came from where you're getting them from yeah yeah and that, and that was andy and myself uh, both our parents were into soul and, and mm. rock and motown and stuff and i think that's where we got that that sort of interest from as well favorite break have you got one the amen breaks pretty hard yeah. to beat but yeah. um the thing is that it's like your favorite record you know yeah. like, <laughs> anything you haven't heard for ages sounds a lot better doesn't yeah. it so, yeah yeah um well, unfortunately we've, we've used so many breakbeats in our tunes over the years that we've ruined a few of them <laughs> <laughs> never to be played again <laughs> <laughs> well that's probably about all we've got time for um so many thanks for coming down so right, thanks um you know thanks thanks for talking to us today that's okay anytime um, anytime and for you guys watching at home, this uh, full interview is going to be archived on the YouTube channel, so uh, you can go back and watch it all again. Um, also, keep locked to, to the Point Blank Facebook and the blog as well. Um, all the details of forthcoming interviews and masterclasses will be up on there very shortly. Um, and that's about it from us. If you do have any more questions, feel free to post in the chat room and we'll try and get them over to Lee. Uh, but that's it, so thanks for watching and uh, we'll see you soon. Cheers.